Praise God for the cross. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. You know, it's such an honor to be here in America and to be able to understand the power of the cross and all that Jesus has provided for us through the cross. It's incredible. I love to minister the Word of God. I love to make a contribution in somebody's life. That's my goal when we share the Word, ministering churches. It is important in missions, of course, to bless missions. But I also want to look at what God has for us today and to touch your life with what God has for you. I want to talk today about something that we don't often talk about. In fact, we don't really like to talk about it. But I just want to share a few things with you about it today. The scripture comes from James, the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. In the Amplified rendering, it says it like this, Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. What is the nature of your life? You will soon disappear into thin air. Now the message rendering says it a bit different, but similar to that. He says, you're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sunshine before disappearing. And the New English translation renders it such, for you are but a puff of smoke that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. Now, when I was a young person, I never thought that death was possible for me. As I grow older, I realize that it's not only possible, it is evident and uh, inevitable that it will come to me as well as it will to us all. You see, we all start in life somewhere like here at birth. <laughs> and we all take this journey, this long journey, and there's a point over here where it's called death. It's the end of this life. It means there is no possibility of a future contribution in this life. You've done everything you're going to do. The point is we don't know exactly how far from the point of birth to that point is. For some, it's very quick or comes rapidly after they're born. Some, it goes on and progresses through life. Some grow to be quite old. But all of us and all that have ever been come to a place in life where life ends. And that's what I want to talk to you today about what happens when our life ends and what do we leave behind. Now Job shared his view and it wasn't one that we particularly care about. He had a lot of problems in this world, but he shares his view of life and says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Our days are upon the earth or but a shadow, he said. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Now God's made some incredible creatures in his creative powers. As you know, there's things that we would never know about, we'll never know about. There's things that God has made that we will never see. But there's some things that are rather interesting as far as their span of life. Now, in this part of the country, do you have fireflies? You do? You know what I'm talking about with a firefly. They're beautiful. They fly usually together, and they kind of light up an area. They glow. And it's a, a really amazing. How do they get that energy in them to be able to do that? Well, a firefly, they say, lives about two months and then dies normally. And all I've got to say to the firefly, if you've got that short of lifespan, then when you get to glow and glow, baby, glow. Because your opportunity to contribute is very short-lived. Now, it also talks about the mayfly. A mayfly is an aquatic insect. That is a, 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 an insect that hovers and comes from water. Aquatic insect. The mayfly's lifespan of an adult mayfly can vary from just 30 minutes to one day, depending on the species. There's 2,500 different species. And what I say to the mayfly this morning, I just suggest they don't oversleep. Because if they do, they will never arrive. You know, they said about Columbus, they said when he left his home, he didn't know where he was going. And when he got to America, he didn't know where he was. And when he got back home, he didn't know where he had been. And I know a few Christians like that, don't you? 
There's some folks in life, they just kind of meander through life, but don't really have a purpose. They don't have a goal. They don't think about giving something back to this world. They just want to have a good time and live it up, and that's all that there is. But, oh, that's so far from the truth today. Now, Methuselah, God made a long-living man there. He lived 969 years. Let me ask you something. You folks that are up about where I am or above, can you imagine living 969 and have all the aches and pains you've got today? They've got to get worse when you get up four or 500, I imagine. <laughs> and I don't think I'd want that. But, oh, yeah, he lived a long time. And then maybe you heard of Charlie Smith. Probably not, but maybe you did. He came to the United States about 140 years ago. Uh, in October, on October the 7th, 1979, Charlotte and I were living in Sacramento, California. We were the state youth director there at that time. And uh, he was 137 years of age living in America, and he had died two days earlier on October the 5th. He was 137 years of age. Wow. Now, my mom, she kind of had longevity, you might say. Uh, she lived to be 99. She passed away about three years ago. But there was something about mom in her last part of life, the last 20, 30 years, but she lived by herself after my stepfather had passed away, and, and she didn't, didn't go to a rest home until the last about six months of her life, just before she passed away. Uh, and she was a really incredible person in that she went to a senior center for the last 16 years of her life, and she worked at that senior center, and the way she described it was, I'm going to the senior center to help take care of those old folks. And that was something, wasn't it? And so she would go there, and they loved her there. You know what? When she gave and helped others, you know, not one person at that senior center would think she had one fault because she was so happy and so excited in what she was doing. But, you know, she wasn't perfect. She was wonderful, but she wasn't perfect because we that knew her best knew that. But as long as she could keep really involved in helping others, her life was fulfilled, and God used her in a very special way. So for 16 years, she played the piano 30 minutes a day for five days a week, 16 years. They paid her $50 a week for playing the piano. So at 98, she was still bringing in the dough. Wow, that ain't bad, is it? I'll tell you what. Now... When we look at life, though, even though it may be 99 years or 137 years or 969 years, whatever it is, when it starts, it's going to end somewhere. We know that. Of course, we know that uh, whenever we live this life, we have the opportunity to do what we want to with our life. Even as believers, we do that. It was Solomon who, again, did not have a real good look at life because 38 times in his book, he talks, he laments about life. He talks about emptiness, futility. He talks about that which leaves nothing behind. You see, he wasn't really talking about life itself. He was talking about ending life, leaving nothing behind. That's the thing that's scary when you think about God giving us a time in this world. And when we end life, we've never really made an impact on anybody else in this world. And by the way, the only thing that you're ever going to keep when you leave this world is that which you have invested in people in this world when you leave. Amen. Did you know that? Oh, yes. Now, the Psalm 62 and 9 says it like this. It talks about common people. They're as worthless as a puff of wind, and the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on the scales together, all together they're less than a breath, lighter than a breath of air. Anybody remember Bernie Madoff? How many remember Bernie Madoff? Yeah. Well, I hope you wasn't one of his clients. Because he smuggled, he smuggled, he uh, robbed people of, actually, he had a Ponzi scheme, and he swindled people out of $50 billion. That's with a B, not an M. $50 billion. Well, they finally caught Bernie, and he's in jail now. He's not called Bernie anymore. He just called number 61727-054. I tell you what, he had probably the greatest Ponzi scheme that had ever been developed in this world. He had it. But it's sad to think about the investment that he made was to take away from others and to leave hurt. And now he has absolutely nothing whatsoever to show for it. I love the little poem that talks about Jesus and Alexander and how different they were. 
It says it something like this. One gained all for self, and one himself he gave. One conquered every throne, the other every grave. When died the Greek, forever fell his throne of swords. But when Jesus died, he rose again as king and lord of lords. Jesus and Alexander both died at 33. The Greek made all men slaves, but the Jew made all men free. One was born, uh, one, uh, one's throne was a uh, uh, bolstered by blood, the other by love. One was born of earth, the other from above. When died the Greek, forever fell his throne of swords. But Jesus, thank God, he lives forevermore. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And you see, it's what you do with life. It's what you give in life. It's not just receiving. It's not just getting. What some believers don't even realize, that when you get so many blessings like we do here in America, and God fills us over and over and over again, if we don't have an outlet, if we don't have a way to get it out into other people's lives, pretty soon it gets stagnant in our life, and, and we're miserable, and, and we're not fresh. But oh, when you give what God gives you, and it flows through you into other lives, hallelujah, it opens a channel for God to pour in more goodness and blessings and freshness into your life. That's what God wants believers to know and to understand that that's what really makes a believer fulfilled is when we carry our heart, our blessing that God gives us and touch other lives. We said of Alexander the Great, the man I talked to you about that in that poem, that when he died he gave the orders to the men that would carry him in death, and said, leave my arms outside, hands outside the casket so the people can see that all that I gained in this world, I could take nothing, not one iota with me when I left this world. And I love Jim Elliott. You've heard of him, the missionary Jim Elliott, who I believe it was Ecuador, where he went, and in 1949, before he went to the mission field, he wrote these words, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain, what he cannot lose. Think about it. And Jim, he, Elliot, and his team went down and in a mission party there trying to reach the natives of that land. And uh, they came and they massacred him and killed his team and him too. You would think that would be the end of the story, but oh no, because out of that came an incredible story of how God moved among that tribe, and they, many, almost all of that entire tribe was one to the Lord Jesus Christ because of Jim Elliot and his commitment to serve God and to share the message with others. And I tell you what, Brother Jim Elliot, he's in glory now, but when we get to glory, we're going to find out that Jim Elliot in that short life would have given and touched so many more lives than most people would ever think about in this world. World, and what a day it's going to be of celebration when we get to glory and see the impact we've been able to make in the lives of others, we pray. Amen. I think about Moffat comments. He said, death is never the last word in the life of a righteous man because we leave something behind. So I ask you this morning, when you die in this world, will you leave behind simply an epitaph? Or will you leave a legacy? Now, I've looked at a lot of epitaphs. I'm sure you have too. Sometimes graveyard. You know, that's a great thing to do for passing time. Go to a graveyard somewhere and just read the epitaphs. Don't you think that'd be fun? Whatever they say. What was their main thing in life? I, I, I read about one there. And this is kind of cute. On the epitaph, it said, I told you I was sick. Made a believer out of them, didn't he? And then there was one that said, Here lies Butch. We planted him raw. He was quick on the trigger, but slow on the draw. And then here lies the body of Jonathan Blink. He stepped on the gas instead of the brake. But here's the one I like the best. Hooray! No more taxes! Hallelujah! We'll all shout about that, won't we? <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. But you see, people, when you have an epitaph, and that's all there is to it, really, you never made impact. There's very few people who ever see that impact. And when they do, they'll forget about it very shortly. But when it comes to touching other lives, they live on forever. There was a young girl, four years of age. Her name was Joy Norwood. Back in about 2010, she was hit by a hit-and-run driver and killed as she was coming back from t-ball practice. And uh, when the father found out who had run over her, he found it was a family friend, a, a black 
couple that had very little of anything. So what his natural reaction would be would simply be to gain anger and vengeance and go point his finger and say, I can't believe you did such a thing. But you know what he did? He did something that's hard for us to do. He became like Jesus. Do you know it's tough? When we're at the disadvantage for us to become like Jesus, but that's the greatest testimony you can have. So he goes over to Eunice Parker, the man that killed his daughter, before the funeral even was conducted. He goes to him, he wraps his arms around him. The first thing he says is, I forgive you. Now, no, humanly, that's impossible. You have to be like Jesus to be able to do that. But something came out of that. In fact, it reached around the world. It was so incredible. Because of this incredible reception, God began to move in that community that was so racially and economically divided anyway, a small town. And, and, and Grove Norwood, Joy's father, went to the city department and said, we want to do something for Euless Parker. We want to build him a home. He has nothing worth living in. And that whole town come together and begin to build him a, a home to live in for him and his wife. And then in, that was in 2001, and uh, one minister that was there, he's called Reverend Clay Spears, he said that when the town came together and began to build this home for this man, he said, I saw an invisible God become visible in this town. I love what it says in John 1 and 14, the message. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you what, we can't make an impact on people if all we do is just pull it into ourselves. We just come and worship and enjoy what God gives us. We make an impact on people when we let the true gospel live in our life and touch other lives. Hallelujah. So I say this morning, share the gospel and if necessary, use words. Amen. Yeah. Get rid of ungodly attitudes. Place a greater value on others. Don't think you have to have everything that everybody has in this earth. Remember, heaven is real. And it has more than we can ever imagine. Thank God. And thank God I'm going there. And when I get there, I'm going to have a lot of friends that I've been able to impact in this world. Amen. This man that had forgiven Euless Parker of killing his daughter, he developed a film. In fact, you can get it, I think, still. It's called The Heart of Texas Movie.com. He won numerous awards. Over 30,000 people around the world were impacted by this. But it went into the prison system. And the prison chaplain of all the prisons in Texas recommended that this video be shown to all inmates because it helped them understand how to deal with that terrible feeling of resentment and hatred and against themselves as well as others and help them to understand that there was a Savior that really cared. What, am I, what are you saying? I'm saying that when you make an investment in this world, and you make an investment in somebody, you don't know what it's going to bring. You never know. You see, I can come here and bring a beautiful apple. Now, I come from the state of Washington, where we grow these beautiful apples. They're big, red, they're red, delicious apples. And of course, I know you grow some here. I know they're good, but, you know, they're not Washington apples. Forgive me. But anyway, these things, perfect temperature, just a lot of things that brings them to this pristine condition. And I can bring that and cut that in half this morning, and I can count every seed there is in that apple. I said, if you plant this, this seed, you'll have a great apple tree. But what I can't do is I can't tell you how many apples are in one seed. And so when you give and you touch other lives, you never know the impact that it will make. Amen. It was Eric Kimball who shared his faith he was a junior boys teacher in 1856 with a Boston shoe clerk who gave his heart to the Lord who happened to be Dwight L. Moody, who in one of his campaigns he went and a man came forward to be saved. His name was Wilbur Chapman, another great evangelist. Then Billy Sunday was one through this. Then Mordecai Ham in the southeastern United States. And then in Mordecai Ham's revival or tent, uh, evangelistic crusade, a man came down and he said, what is your name, sir? He gave his heart to the Lord. He said, my name is Billy Graham. Let me tell you something. We just don't know the impact. When we give something to God, we don't know how far it'll go. But oh, I don't want to hold everything inside. I want to have the fullness of God's joy and his love and share what he's given me with others around this world. Hallelujah. Quickly, I go on and I'll bring this to a close soon. 
let me share this with you. Incredible testimony. Many years ago, I went on a missions trip. While we were there, it was YWA. And by the way, I want to say YWA is incredible, incredible ministry. Uh, we were youth directors for 17 years, state youth directors for 17 years. And we know what it is, the impact that YWA is. So don't ever forget YWA. It's a great, great missions emphasis for the young people here. But uh, when we were there on one of our trips, we went to Dachau, which was a terrible concentration camp where the Jews, many Jews were killed by the Nazis during the war. Did you know that in 1933, in 21 countries of Europe that would later be occupied by the Nazis, in 1933 there were 9 million Jews that were there, but by 1945, two out of every three European Jew had been murdered by the Nazis, including 1.5 million children and also thousands of handicapped children literally murdered put in mass graves. Mrs. Sendler, who was working for the Nazi government, God put her there, no doubt, because she believed in the Lord. She was a wonderful person. And she would go in, along with 30 team members that she had, and would go into these concentration camps because she was authorized to do so and treat the sick and carry out the dead and so on. She would go in there, and when they had children in there, she would talk to their parents because they knew what was going to happen to them. And those that wanted her to, would take, she would take the children after writing down information about them, and they would smuggle them out. They used all kinds of, of resources. They used coffins and suitcases and gunny sacks. They used a sewer system to get it out. An ambulance driver who smuggled the infants had trained a dog to begin barking whenever the baby began to cry so the guards would not be... Uh, alerted, and the, the dog would bark louder than the baby was crying. So they couldn't even tell it as they were bringing them out. It was incredible. Over 2,500 babies she saved along with her team from certain death because she loved them, loved God. In October the 20th, 1943, that was, by the way, 25 days before I was born, before I came into this world, she was arrested in prison and tortured by the Gestapo who broke her feet and her legs and scheduled her for execution. Just before she was executed, God worked out a miracle. Well, one of the guards let her go. And she went and hid, and when the war was over, she went into her home, and in the backyard, she began to dig it up, because in the backyard, there were jars, and every jar contained information about the babies she had taken out, about who they were, as much ge genealogical information as they could, so she could reunite them with some family members or some relatives after the war was over. And it was incredible. She went and got this information and dug up the backyard, and those 2,500 children, young people, children that she saved, most of those they were able to reunite with families after this. But now the war is over. She's growing older. She actually grew to be 98 years of age. Incredible. And one of the men who had called her after the war was over, and he saw her picture, he said to her, he said in a telephone conversation, he said, I remember you, Mrs. Sendler. He said, you were the one that picked me up and took me out of the concentration camp. I remember who you were. And now she's in the rest home. I won't be here long, but while she's there, who do you suppose would come to take care of her? But some or one, I know it was at least one, maybe more than that, of those she had rescued from the camps of certain death in Germany to take care of her. And then I understand that there was a nomination for her to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And I thought, wow, who in the world could be more worthy to receive this peace prize than her. But no, she didn't get it. It went to a man by the name of Al Gore who had showed some videos on, climb, on uh, global warming. You know, and incredible, so sad. But when you think about what people have done, it's so wonderful to know that God can use us. Let me tell you, i got to stay over here. We're taking pictures. I am terrible for anybody taking a movie or a, not a movie, a video. I'm still old-fashioned. That's nothing Charlotte calls videos. She calls them tapes. 
So anyway, but uh, I was uh, in Asia. Uh, this trip was about probably six years ago, and I went to a little orphanage we have. And in that orphanage, now this is children there, but it's, it applies to children everywhere around the world, and certainly to the Kabera mission that we have. It's so incredible in what's happening there. But while I was there, they had just got a baby in that was brought by two weeks earlier that was very sick, had been very sick, and had, had uh, almost blind because of the uh, incredible uh, uh, infection that had gotten in the eyes by the parents didn't care. The mother didn't want the baby anymore, and she was going to let it die, just set it down on the street and let it die. But the orphanage got it. And uh, the baby also was HIV positive. And I never forget, I took that baby, Pastor. That baby was one month old, and I held that little baby in my arms, and she was so beautiful. You just never seen a more beautiful baby than that little girl. Her infection had cleared up, and now she was fine, and, uh, but she still had HIV because her mother had AIDS. And uh, they took that baby in, even though they weren't really equipped for it, they did. And they give her a name called Zoe. Anybody know what Zoe means? Life, from death to life. That's Jesus, folks. That's Jesus. And uh, when I was over in Asia again about three years ago, I got this email. I was in Cambodia, in fact, and I got this email. And they said, Sister Somnook. Now, Sister Somnook, Brother Somnook's wife, that's a missionary, wonderful people. We know him well. And his last name is Montre Lahler Drasme. So that's why we call him Brother Somnook. You got it? And we call her Sister Somnook. But she emails me this thing. I said, oh, we just want to tell you, we just got Zoe to the doctor. She just got her three-year physical. And the doctor said, she's doing so well. And he said, she said, by the way, he said, she no longer has HIV. Wow. Woo! I tell you what. That'll make a man 70 years old shout. So if I can shout just a little bit, I'll do it, okay? Oh, and to see the impact, what a beautiful picture, and to see the impact of one that was there, and now God is using her. Think how many lives she will touch, and how many lives she will change. Praise God. That's what the gospel is all about. That's what world missions is all about, is to take something that God gives us, and just let it run into somebody else's life, and make an impact. And one day when we get to heaven, Brother Sluter, we're going to know, I believe God's going to let us know how many lives we've been able to impact, and make a difference in. Praise God. God. Oh, hallelujah. Because we cared. And let me tell you, the greatest joy you will ever get in life, the greatest joy is when you help someone else, especially help someone else find the Lord Jesus Christ and take them out of that misery that they're living in and give them a life that is worth living here. Amen. So I thank you today. It's been such an honor. I love this pastor and his wife. Just some people, you get around, you don't have to be around them long. You just all of a sudden, you say, man, so genuine, so caring, talented, and blessed, a great minister. I watched a, one of the, got online and, and saw a, a, a message that he had preached and, and didn't get to see all of it, but got to see quite a bit of it online. I said, man, it's great. I can't wait to get there. And I'm so glad we got to come. What a great church. We love you. Brother Robert, come on up here, and we want you just to close the service and receive whatever offering you're going to receive from missions and however you'd like to. But we thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I would love to. Yes, I will. Father, we are so thankful right now for the privilege that Charlotte and I have been here today. We don't believe this is an accidental appointment. We believe this is an appointment made by you, Lord. We believe that our honor of being here today has been to share some things that have got into some people's lives. Not just an emotional response, but Lord, to realize that they themselves individually can touch lives around the world where they'll never go and they'll never know those people. But they don't know whenever they release that and they give that prayer and they give that offering and they touch through the world missions, Church of God world missions, and as it goes to these places, God, what an impact it's going to make and how many lives are going to be changed. Oh, God, bless this church, I pray. Oh, God, bless Brother and Sister Sluter and honor their desire to see it grow. And, oh, God, I pray that you would fill it with your spirit like I felt this morning and we all felt together. And Oh, God, that you would bring people in as we give out to others. God, bring people into this place. God, let them see that this is the place they need to be where they can be touched and blessed and used of God, we pray. Oh, we thank you, Lord, now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Ida da 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 da
Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Brother Haggard. I was you see his heart this morning. He loves the Lord and he has a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we call it world missions when we take it outside the United States, but it's the same message here. Jesus loves us. Amen. Just a moment, the ushers are going to, uh, we're going to start a video here in just a few minutes, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of indication of what's going to go on for the next few moments. We're going to watch a, a video. And when something moves me, I always think everybody else will see it, so it's just out of my heart that uh, this video I've had for several years, uh, um, there's a missions video that we put together in the Church of God, and one of the reasons I want you to see this is that uh, you'll see some kids praying here in just a moment. And uh, I'm going to have the ushers just hold on for just a second. I'm going to give some instructions here. The, uh, in the video, you'll see some kids praying closer to the end. That, those are the kids from Kibera Kids Center that we are uh, helping to keep uh, the Wombles, who are the directors there. Uh, we're, we're sponsoring them and, and helping with that. It's one of the projects that we're, that we're doing. So you'll see firsthand, it's not about just feeding those who are hungry, but you'll see how God has changed their life, and they're sold out for Jesus Christ, and they know how to pray. So I want you to see that, and then you'll see some scenes of just God moving around the world in some services. If you notice at the beginning of our service, you, if you was here right before we began, we were showing a, a video to show the power of God in a worship service, and that same presence that was there is in this video here too, and I think it will move us to see the Spirit of God, not just a, just a service, but you can see the Spirit of God on people, and this will bless you. So I think this will just stir our hearts for missions, what we're doing when we're ministering around the world. So in just a moment as the video starts, the ushers are first going to come around and just give you a card. And so this card, as we've done before, you've been around a lot and probably have had faith pledge cards. And uh, this is very simple. You don't have to put your name on this or sign it. But we do want to kind of have an idea how many have given. I praise the Lord. Many of you have already done this. If you've done it already, do it again if you can. But uh, the we've been... About 20 different households have been given the $7 a week to Yes to Missions. And this is just kind of that recommitment to that. And so there's just a couple of places you could park, mark $7 a week or $30 a month. Or if you have another amount you want to give, uh, you could put that there. But this is just to kind of help us to see uh, you know, how many are, are making this, uh, this pledge. And, and what we're doing with our missions, again, part of it goes to World Missions. Part of it goes to... Home mission, some of it goes to our benevolent center here. And so just a moment, the ushers, we're not taking an offering yet, gentlemen. You can uh, uh, go ahead and have a seat. And then I just want you to be a part of blessed with this. I want to let you know what's going on, too. Um, in June is our state camp meeting where all the Church of God uh, in the state of Indiana come together. Now, I'm saying this because some of you may not know the, about the Church of God a whole lot. We're not in this by ourselves, uh, Brother Tiger and his wife come to us from our headquarters and because we have a great denomination across the country and we can do more things together than we can do by ourselves. I praise the Lord that I'm a part of a family and uh, I know we're not the, the only denomination, we're not a perfect denomination, but I'm glad that we're part of this denomination because God is moving through this church of God around the world. And so we're going to give at our camp, our camp meeting, we're taking a missions offering. I already let you know just uh, last week and the last couple weeks that for the month of May, any loose offerings that you give will go to missions. And the missions offering that we're collecting for the month of May that are loose and not designated, we're going to take to camp meeting. As a state, we're going to help, again, the Wombles, who are the directors of the Cabrera Center, for their personal uh, budget that they need to be able to stay in the field. See, the missionaries have to raise their own budget. So if we have a great orphanage there, but no director, we're not going to have an orphanage there. So we need to raise the funds. And so their, uh, their budget for the next two years is about $25,000. We're not doing this by ourselves, but we're a part of helping them out. So every month when you give... Part of our, your mission's money is already going to that. Some of it's going to another missionary we have here out of Indiana, Tom Rossens, who in, who is in Europe. We have some that goes to the ministry to Israel. So we're touching different parts of the world. Some of it goes to YWA, which is Youth World Evangelism in Action. So we're spreading our, our wings as far as we can. My 
heart and goal is that we'll have uh, 12 projects that we fall in love with and that we want to help support with a minimum of $50 to each project a month. Now, we may not be able to do that this month or next month, but I believe in faith we can get there. Amen? Because everything that we send out, it, it just does something for us that God blesses us back. And no one is asked to, to carry the whole load themselves, but I believe if we will have a heart for missions, God will bless. This is why I say that. I have another uh, gift I want to give to you as you leave today. On your way out, you'll be given a CD. It's from a uh, General Assembly where all the Church of God around the world comes together. In 2002, the, our World Missions Night, uh, the evangelist was Dan Betzer, who's an Assembly of God pastor. He preached the best World Missions message I have ever heard in my life. That message changed my life to give more to missions. And, and I want you to listen. If I, I pray you'll take this home. Who still has a CD player? I know that's really kind of a thing of the past. But find one. Play this, play this audio message. Play it all the way through because the very end of it is what you need to hear. But you need to hear the whole message. It's less than an hour, but it will be worth your time. It will impact your heart. And so we're going to watch this video together. And after uh, this video, we are going to take up our offering. And so you'll want to be able to give your tithes. If you mark on your envelope... Uh, missions, the $7, that still goes into our normal plan. Any loose offerings or anything that's not designated like general fund, if you say general fund, it will go to general fund. Um, if, you want the, if you're writing a check and you want some of that or you write a separate check to go to this offering that we're taking to camp meeting, just put it on the other line at the bottom. Just put uh, missions on that. We know that it's different than the $7 a week. We want to honor what you're intending your money to go to, but we have a heart for missions. Amen? And so let's let this video go through. Be blessed through this, and then we'll come back and receive your gifts today. From the north, the south, the east, and the west, from every corner of the world, Pentecostal revival fire is spreading rapidly during these last days. As proclaimed by the prophet Joel in chapter 2, And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those last days I will pour out my Spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. But ye shall receive power, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Before the Azusa Street Revival early in the 20th century, the Church of God experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in such a way that the Pentecostal flame continues to burn in its witnesses today in over 160 nations around the world. In the year 1900, there were less than 10,000 Pentecostal Christians. Today, there are over 600 million, and this third wave of Christendom is growing faster than any other movement in the world. Professor Harvey Cox calls Pentecost a religion made to travel. The Church of God is unquestionably a part of what God is doing in the world through this Holy Ghost outpouring. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated particularly in Romania, Belgium, and Russia. In Romania, more than 2,500 congregations witness hundreds filled with the Holy Spirit each week. The New Jerusalem Church in Brussels, Belgium, is the largest Protestant church in the country. Even Siberia and Russia are experiencing the fall of Holy Spirit fire. In Central America, Guatemala is experiencing a mighty revival. The country now has over 1,800 churches. 93 of them have more than 500 members each. During a recent celebration in Guatemala, more than 50,000 people gathered.
In Asia, since August of the year 2000, over one million new members have joined the Church of God as the Holy Spirit sweeps through 27 countries in this area. During this period, over 600 new churches have been planted in India. The mighty move of the Spirit is filling Indonesians and Filipinos and sending them throughout the world as missionaries. The bright light of the Spirit's flame is ablaze on what was once known as the Dark Continent of Africa, where the Church of God has more than 4,000 congregations in 32 countries. Thousands are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Even the children are involved with fervent Pentecostal prayer, and Uganda is sending missionaries into the Sudan. The Holy Spirit is being poured out in these last days to fulfill the Bible's prophecy, to defeat Satan, to exalt Jesus Christ, and to gather in the global harvest. The harvest is ripe. The time is now. With the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we must all stand together, move quickly into the highways and the byways, go into all nations, reach all peoples preaching and teaching the powerful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I desire that move for us, amen? I'm blessed when I see it because it's real. I want us to experience that. God is so good, amen? If you'll take your card, if you haven't already filled it out, as you give given the offering today, just be obedient to the Lord. The Lord is good. He has a plan for each one of us. And if we're able to invest in someone else's life and not just hold it all back for ourselves, He will do great and marvelous things as Sister Wonder, if you'll come and to the praise team as we're just closing today. And as our ushers begin to come back this way. If you'll take your offering and then hold it in your hand. And take that card. Let's commit it to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we honor you in this place. We give you praise. 
Lord, we're desiring for the move of your spirit, afresh and anew. We know that we can't pay for it. We can't buy it. But Lord, as we freely give to you and we open up our arms to you, and you see that our heart is what your heart is, is for around the world. I pray, oh God, the day that you just move in this place, move in our hearts, move in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you bless the Lord as you give this morning? Hallelujah. Let's just sing this. Oh, to Jesus. Ah. Uh...